Capital is any money you set aside to be invested in an enterprise to bring value to the marketplace, hoping to make a profit. I might give you time to write that down because it's it's the definition of capitalism. The capital of capitalism could be money, and any money you set aside to be invested in an enterprise, a business. That brings value to the marketplace, hoping to make a profit. The process is called capitalism, and the money is called capital. But capital can be more than money. So make that note: capital can be more than money. Time that you set aside to be invested, just like the money set aside to be invested. You set aside time to be invested. If you say to someone, if you start part time, 15 hours a week, that 15 hours now is capital time. There's capital money and capital time. Now, this money and time that you set aside must not be given away. It must not be wasted. It must be invested. If a farmer has seed corn to plant, he wouldn't eat the seed corn. He wouldn't feed it to his family. Not this corn. Other corn, yes, but not this corn, because this corn is capital corn, and this capital corn is to be planted in the ground so that it can multiply and grow for the harvest in the fall. Okay, so there's capital time and capital money. Now here's the rest of the list, and everyone here can develop a list like this. Guess where I taught this? In Russia, in Moscow, not far from the Kremlin. It's incredible. Here it is. First, now was the money. Second was the time. Here was number three: desperation. Now, desperation can be a positive emotion if it has a positive purpose. Sometimes de- desperation is tragic, leads to tragic results. But desperation, if it's invested in something positive, can be very positive. I have to. I have to keep talking every day till I find someone who wants these products. Now I don't know when the magical change occurs, but let me give you the next quality: determination. Desperation says I have to. Determination says I will. From one emotion to another, I have to to I will. Some and who knows when that occurs. But even if you start with desperation, I have to make this successful. I have to get started. I have to get going. That's a good emotion if you've got an ultimate purpose. But here's what's really powerful. It's more powerful than money. Determination. I will. What did I hear in the training? If you've set a goal for five, you just say, "I just I must not go home till I've talked to the fifth person." Somebody says, "What are you doing at Denny's?" Eleven o'clock at night. Got one more person to talk. Set a goal, determined to reach it. So determination is more valuable than money. Next is energy and vitality. This is called investing yourself. Money, yes. Time, yes. Now you invest your inner self. Energy and vitality. Here's the next quality, and that was courage. Mark Hughes conducted his first meeting, got some of his friends and relatives together, and said, "Here's my new product. We're going to take it around the world. How many of you want to join?" And everyone in the meeting said, "We're not interested." His first meeting, a hundred percent said, "We're not interested." Now, what do you need? Courage to do the second meeting. The second meeting, someone said yes, and then Mark did another meeting, another meeting. Another meeting, but that takes courage. Here's the next quality. It's called ingenuity. Ingenuity. Here's what it means in English. Ingenuity means figuring out a way to make something work. Figuring out a way. If at first it doesn't seem like there's a way, then you just keep thinking, figuring out a way.、And、then here's the magic word: until you have the answer. You keep figuring out a way until you have the answer. You just don't stop 
figuring a way until you have the answer. That's ingenuity. And all of us have ingenuity. Plan A, if that doesn't work, plan B. If plan B doesn't work, we'll go to plan C. We'll keep figuring, working, till finally we come up with the answer. Someone says to me, I have this relative that won't buy the product. What should I do? And I said, sell everyone around this person the product until they're the only one left. If at first there doesn't seem to be a way, you just keep thinking, thinking, thinking of a way. To reach someone, you just figure out a way. You say, well, I call him, I call him. How about sending a telegram? Just figure out a way to reach someone, call someone, get an answer. Now, here's what happened next, and it's the key to riches. What is the secret to becoming wealthy? I'm going to give the answer. The key to wealth and riches is ambition. Ambition. How easy is it to create ambition? And here's the answer. It could start as soon as you've sold the first customer. If I can get one customer, I can get another one. Then when you have two customers, here's what will start turning over in your mind. If I can get two, I can get four. If I can get four, I can get 10. If I could get 10 people to use my products, why couldn't I get 100 people to use the products? That kind of ambition leads to wealth. It's just a matter of time. So here's the key. Get your ambition started and then help it to grow. Here's what else gets our ambition to grow. Listening to the testimony. You may pick up some ideas from someone's testimonial that will be just as valuable as what I share from this podium. And sometimes a, a word spoken in private from someone's unique testimonial is so powerful. It's just as powerful as all the words given by the presenter. So take that all home. A uh, lady said to me that I met once in New York. She was vice president of this company. She made big money. I don't think she finished her high school education. She was still young, with a young family. And I said to her, how did you get here? This is a tough business. You make big money. You didn't graduate from high school. What happened? And she said, well, let me tell you part of the story. She said, years ago, one day I asked my husband for $10 and he said, what for? She said, by the end of that day, I had promised myself that I would never, ever ask for money again. And she said, yes, I am vice president. Yes, I do make big money. Yes, I am young. Yes, I did not graduate from high school. But she said, I promise you, Mr. Rohn, from that day until this, I have never asked for money again. She said, I started searching for opportunity, found it, started taking some classes, learned the skills, totally changed my life. I'm sure she would say that was one of the days that turned her life around. Now, here's what else. I'm just going to give you quickly now the rest of the list because I have some more things to cover. Okay, we had capital money. Here's what capitalism does. Buys and sells. Capitalism buys and sells. But here's, if you have to, if there's no other choice, here's what you can also do, sell and buy. Here's the next quality, personality. You know, what, what is especially you, your personality? But here's my best advice on personality. Refine your personality to fit the business. If you're too shy now, you need to work on that. Develop your personality so that it fits the business. You might have to try harder than someone else to go talk to someone, but you've just got to do it. You've just got to do it. Refine your personality to fit the business. Then there's two or three more. Next is trust. To trust the future. Trust the present. Here's what else you have to do. Trust the people. Trust the people that they will make a wise decision. Trust the people that they will change and grow. 
trust the people that they will do the right thing. Here's the next quality, compassion. Having a feeling for other people's problems. They're unhappy with their income, they're unhappy with their health, they're unhappy with their life. And you need enough compassion to say, I will take what answers I have to as many people as I can reach. So jot that down as I finish this list. I will take what answers I have to as many people as I can reach. I will take the answers I have to as many people as I can reach. How to build a successful team of people to accomplish some purpose. If you've got something in mind, whether it's enterprise or organization or or whether it's church or whether it's sports, doesn't matter what it is. If you want to find good people, here's part of the challenge, finding a successful team of people. To put together a good team, I've got a checklist for you. It's got four parts to it. Here's number one, history. It's not a bad idea to check history. Somebody's qualifications to do the job, just take a look. Now we can't go into too much detail on any one of these, but let me just give you the list. Number two, check interest. If somebody's interested, they're probably a good prospect. Now, sometimes people can fake their interest, but if you've been a leader for a while, you can be a pretty good judge of whether or not somebody is faking you out on what we call true interest. And you just have to have some face-to-face -face conversation just to check out to the best of your ability. You won't hit it every time, but you can get pretty good at checking what we call true interest. A group came to Jesus one day and said, we wish to be disciples. He said, gentlemen, you've put your story on the wrong man. And they said, wow. He said, unfortunately, I can read your heart. They said, oh, they didn't want to be disciples. They had all kinds of trickery in mind, but he picked up on it right away. And he wasn't faked out by the we wish to be. Now you might not get quite this good at reading hearts, but I'm telling you, you can get pretty good as a leader in judging somebody's what we call true interest. Here's the third part of the checklist. Check response. Response tells you a lot about someone's integrity and character and interest and skill. If someone says you have to get there how early? You have to stay how late? The break is only 10 minutes. Two evenings a week? Saturdays? That give you any clues? These are called clues, right? Don't go past these clues, clues, clues on what we call response. A person's response quickly illustrates their philosophy. We only respond based on what we know and our attitude and philosophy is so bound up. And we might, you know, be clever for a while, but pretty soon response is going to come truly from our philosophy. And if there's any great errors there in philosophy and attitude, here's one of the places where it shows up in response. And here's the last piece of the checklist in putting together a good team, check results. Finally, the name of the game is results. How else are we gonna judge? That's the final judge, results. It is the name of the game. Results must soon match quality. You might have a nice guy, but finally you got to have results. Nice, don't get it. Now there's two parts to results. Here it is. Number one, activity results. Sometimes we don't ask for productivity right away. All we ask for first is activity. Now it's pretty easy to check activity. If you join the sales organization and you're supposed to make 10 calls first week, it's pretty simple on Friday, right? Pretty simple on Friday. Say, John, how many calls did you make? John says, well, you say, John, well, won't fit in my little box here. And John starts on a story. And you say, John, the reason I made this box so small is so a story won't fit. I just need an activity number from one to 10. Now, if the results on activity first week are not good, those have got to be signals, clues. Now, you might try another week. But you got to be the judge, right? How far you go in putting a team together with somebody's lack of precise activity. Now, finally, here's the last part, productivity. Finally, the tree must have figs, finally. The ultimate test of a quality team is productivity. Fruit evidence.
measurable progress in reasonable time. Now, as a leader, you've got to learn to measure results and productivity and activity. And here's part of the skill of leadership. Be upfront in team building with what you expect. Don't let the surprises come later. Put it up front. God was very upfront, Old Testament. God says, if you move toward me, I move toward you. See, that's very upfront. That's called making it fairly clear. You take a step by step. Now, I only ask you to take human steps. I take God's steps, you take human steps. But you got to take a step. Because here's how as it reads. You don't move, I don't move. You say, well, that's arbitrary. Well, when you're God, you can set it up that way. When you get your planet, you can set it up however you want to. This one is set up. I got a good philosophical statement for you. Life was designed to respond to deserve, not to need. On this planet, it doesn't read, if you need, you will reap. No, it reads, if you plant, you will reap. You say, well, I really need to reap. Then you really need to plant. Life wasn't designed for the needers. Life was designed for the planters. Life doesn't respond to what we need. Life responds to what we deserve by activity, belief, faith, action, movement. You got to take a step. So one of the things to make clear when you're bringing somebody on board is say, Mary, if you step, we do these things. If you take three steps, we go this, this, and this, and this. And if you do this, we do all of this. But if you don't move, we don't move. It's very important to make it clear why. Because everybody needs to pay. Everybody needs to pay. Even if the payment is only token, it has to be paid. Because life responds to deserve, not need. Fascinating study. Here's one of the clues to leadership. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Now we're talking team building now. We're talking winning a championship. We're talking putting together an enterprise. And the key to leadership is teach people how to deserve it. Teach them how to take the steps. Teach them how to make the moves. And we only ask for token moves. We only ask for limited activity. We only ask for steps in the right direction. But without the steps, we have no promise. So this is one of the most important things you can do for children is to teach them how to deserve good things, how to deserve the favors, right? You got to pay the price. Prices is how you deserve it. Here's the next key. In building a successful team, you must learn when you've got too many. It's a simple story, it comes from the Bible. Now, being an amateur, you sort of have to take my way of putting it. But good Lord said, just take my word for it, you got too many. And Gideon said, well, what should I do? And the good Lord said, try this. Get the 32,000 troops together and give them your last final ringing speech. We're off to fight the Midian. And he said, when you finish the speech, finish it like this. Now then, that we're off to fight, if there's anybody here that's afraid, and you think we're about to lose this battle upcoming with the Midianites, you can be excused this time, go home, can't use you this time. Gideon said, clever, should have thought of that myself. Gets the 32,000 troops together, gets up, gives his last ringing speech and says, we're off to fight. But if there's anybody here who thinks we're going to lose, you can be excused this time. You can just go home. We're just going to take what's left. And Gideon waits. And sure enough, some went home, and the number was 22,000. Gideon says, wow. Hey, if you've got 32,000 and 22,000 think you're going to lose, guess what? You're going to lose. You got too many. Here's the key to leadership. In haste, it's possible to recruit losers. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's possible. You say, well, why is that? It, it, this is called one of those things. When you're moving, no telling who you collect, right? So here's part of the test, you know. Who thinks we're going to lose? You can be excused this time. So Gideon's got 10,000 left. He says, no problem, we'll do it with 10,000. Good Lord says, well, you still got too many. Gideon says, well, what now? And the good Lord says, try this. March the 10,000 till they're hot and thirsty down by the river. And those that are careless, just drop their shield and spear and dive in the water and start drinking. You can't use them, they're too careless. But the ones that keep the spear and the shield and lap the water like a dog, keep looking and alert. Those are the ones because they're trained and ready to go. 
Gideon said clever. And he marches the 10,000 till they're hot and thirsty down by the river. Sure enough, when he gets to the river, some are hot and careless, and they just throw down their spear and shield and jump in the water. And the number was 9,700. Key to leadership. In haste, it's possible to recruit the careless. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's inevitable. This is called one of those things. Now, if you've got an important battle, you got to know who's careless. And this was part of the test. So Gideon says, you 9,700, home. And he sent him home, dripping home. Now he's got 300 left. Gideon said, no problem. From 32,000 to 300, Gideon is still willing to try it. We call that courageous leadership. You've got to read the story. Don't have time to give you the whole scenario, but it was a fascinating story. With 300, the battle plan was the most strange, unusual battle plan ever designed. But he won the day, chased off the Midianites. Gideon becomes the military Jewish hero of the day. His story provided for us to read one more time, which says, as a leader, remember, there are times when you may have too many. This is called inevitable. Next, don't linger too long. If you've got a job to do, sometimes you have to be fairly swift in your analysis of who will and who won't and who can and who can't. Jesus said in putting the Christian philosophy to work, two of you take a city and you two take a city and you two take a city and walk into the city and tell the story. And if they respond fairly soon, stay. And if they don't respond fairly soon, don't stay. He advised them to leave the city that didn't respond fairly soon. So you got to put some time. Now, you've got to be a judge of how much time you give someone to respond or something to respond. This is part of the unusual skill of leadership, learning time dimensions, how much time to give. But Jesus was fairly clear, said, don't stay too long. If the city doesn't buy the story, he said, leave. And I think the reason was fairly clear. There are too many cities that will to linger with those who won't. It's called the law of averages. Play the law of averages. Don't stay too long. Now he gave them some other fascinating instructions. That who knows what it all meant? He said, when you walk out of one of these cities that doesn't buy the story, wipe off your shoes. Whatever that meant in those days, no telling what that meant. If you walked out of somebody's house and wiped off your shoes, I mean, no telling what that meant. There's probably some modern gestures that are just as good, but uh, you know, who knows? I, I don't know. I'm an amateur on this. But what it does mean, leaders must have a sense of timing. We call it measurable progress. You've got to be smart enough to measure progress, and you've got to also be smart enough to understand reasonable time. We can't be unreasonable with time. The enterprise may be lost for lingering too long and not understanding the law of averages.